Dr. Sigler is finished with his uh, prepared, the prepared part of his lecture. Uh, he has kindly agreed to take questions, and I would ask people to make use of the microphones that you see in each aisle when that time comes. So we'll remind you of that uh, after his lecture as well. I would also like to point out that um, this lecture is timely uh, in regards to the College of Medicine's history. Uh, this weekend marks the 35th anniversary uh, of the establishment of the College of Medicine on this campus. And the college exists in partnership with other units across campus. I think most of you know that none of our faculty members have a, uh, a sole uh, appointment in the College of Medicine. Everybody is cross-appointed in other uh, units across campus. Uh, and this is probably well illustrated by the long list of co-sponsors that you will note on the right side of the, uh, the flyer that is uh, distributed around the room. And so we are indebted to our uh, colleagues across campus, both for uh, a remarkable intellectual community and for their support in this lecture as well. Um, and so on behalf of the College of Medicine, I'd like to introduce all of you to Dr. Sigler. Uh, Dr. Sigler, a native of New York, uh, graduated with honors from Princeton, an institution on whose board he currently serves. Uh, he moved to the Midwest uh, to earn his medical degree from the University of Chicago, where he remained for his, the, re, uh, the completion of his clinical training, which included his internship his residency, and serving as the chief resident in internal medicine at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has uh, been at the University of Chicago on the faculty since that time. And since 1984, he has directed the Center for Clinical Ethics, uh, excuse me, the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Uh, by the way, it's worth noting that the US News and World Report has ranked this as the top medical ethics program in the United States for the past three years in a row. This program has trained over 180 physicians and nurses, many of whom uh, direct programs at prominent North American medical schools. Um, and many of them uh, mark their academic lineage uh, back to his tutelage. Uh, Dr. Sigler has held many lectureships, many visiting professorships, and has been the principal investigator on grants too numerous to mention. He's a prolific author, having written over 150 articles, journal articles, over 50 book chapters, and over five books. Um, his latest book, which he has co-authored co with Drs. Johnson and Winslade, is Clinical Ethics, a Practical Approach to Ethical Decisions in Clinical Medicine, and as I understand it, uh, this is the leading eth uh, medical ethics text used by health professions, professionals throughout the country. Perhaps most importantly, however, is the fact that Dr. Sigler has practiced medicine for over 30 years. He's one of only a handful of physicians who combines hands-on hands experience in medical ethics with an active medical practice. So this allows Dr. Sigler to be an, a, an important contributor in two decidedly disparate realms. One is that he explores the fundamental issues of a life well lived. And the other is that he does this at the very practical interface of caring for individuals who trust him with their lives. And so it is my pleasure to uh, welcome this remarkable individual uh, to uh, thank him for participating in the Miller-Com Lecture Series, um, and please offer a warm welcome to our guest. Well, yeah, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm very moved by, by the introductions. Uh, I want to particularly thank uh, Professor Leff and Dean Schwartz for, for such warm words. Uh, Professor Leff, you may not know this, but the University of Chicago was once in the Big Ten. <laughs> in, in 1939, uh, after a season in which our average margin of defeat was 60 points, 
President Hutchins uh, volunteered to have the University of Chicago leave the Big Ten on the condition, I want you to note the condition, that we could return at any time we wanted. <laughs> An opportunity that's not been taken advantage of by any of the subsequent presidents. I am just so delighted to, uh, to join you on this um, exciting and happy occasion of, of the um, uh, 35th anniversary of the College of Medicine um, um, here, here at uh, the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, I particularly want to extend my, my wishes and, and congratulations to the students, alumni, faculty, and, and to the members of the university community who are sharing in this happy occasion. Uh, I'm very honored to have been invited to give this talk uh, as part of the Center of Advanced Study and the Millicom Lecture Series. Um, I, I've looked over uh, the list of previous speakers, uh, the topics of which were referred to uh, by Professor Leff, and I'm sure I don't belong in that series, but it, it really is quite impressive. Um, I also want to thank Madeline Janey, who's been so helpful in making this visit possible. Uh, on, on this, the 35th anniversary, um, there, there's so much to celebrate about the College of Medicine. Um, it has been a place of great achievement. Um, uh, it's following the tradition of the University of Illinois uh, as one of the great research institutions in this country. The College of Medicine continues the, its commitment uh, to excellence in research and education. Uh, of course, as someone who's been involved in medical education for the better part of my career, uh, the majority of my, my life, in fact, uh, I can tell you exactly what you know already, that, that our students are right at the heart of everything that we do. And the College of Medicine has a number of simply extraordinary innovative student programs including the Medical Scholars Program, uh, which has become the third largest combined degree program in the country, and probably is the one most consistently dedicated to interdisciplinary work, as well as the program in urban health that studies the needs of underserved communities. Again, I congratulate the College of Medicine for their innovative approaches to meet the challenges facing medicine in the 21st century. Um, I also recognize the extraordinary growth in the college. As I understand it, it started with 13 students, now has an entering class of 125, and provides uh, not only basic science, but, but clinical education in, in three uh, hospitals that are affiliated with it, including the Carl Clinic and Provena Hospital. These are magnificent achievements in a very short time. Um, and it's just an honor, as I say, to be part of the homecoming celebration and to be part of the anniversary celebration. So I thank you again very much. Um, I'd like to talk today about bioethical challenges in the last 50 years. Uh, these will be three of the four items that I hope to talk about. But I'm going to start by saying that these have been the three issues that have driven our uh, commitment to bioethics uh, since World War II. Uh, I'm going to talk about them in turn. The first one is advances in technology that now let us exert some control uh, over life and death. The second one is human experimentation, especially relating to abuses of human subjects who who are involved in research. And the third is a new understanding of civil and human rights. I'm going to take the first one first, and that's control over life and death. I, I'm not going to be talking today, simply as a matter of time limitation, about new reproductive technologies. But I do want to say something about our ability to forestall death, sometimes reverse terminal disease, uh, and in many ways to control the timing of death. Um, I, I show you on the slide three areas in, in which that, 
that, that new technological and scientific achievements have, have, have occurred. Um, well, here it is, good. Um, th this event in 1954, uh, which was the first successful organ transplant, was essentially the first time in human history that anybody was able to take an individual with an end-stage organ problem, kidney, liver, heart, or lung, and save the life of that person. It was done in Boston in 1954. It was the exchange of um, organs between two identical twins, uh, Richard and Ronald Herrick, and it was, a mo it was a, a milestone in human history. Dialysis, interestingly, uh, developed during World War II, during the Rotterdam bombings, was not really perfected as a technique uh, until, um, until Scribner in Seattle uh, developed the Scribner shunt. And it, came, uh, it became available in 61, and effective ventilators became available in the 1970s. What I say down here is that this ability to reverse end organ disease and keep people alive gave doctors and mankind what I call a Promethean power that they never before had. I want you to keep that in mind. So we're talking about abilities that have emerged in the last 30 to 50 years, very recently. Uh, this just shows you the picture of the two twins, uh, the, the donor and the recipient of that first successful kidney transplant, and the surgeon in the case, Dr. Joseph Murray, is here on the left, receiving the Nobel Prize in 1990 from the King of Sweden. Uh, Dr. Murray uh, received the prize in recognition of all the great work that had gone on in transplantation in, in the ensuing 45 years. Um, th th this is just a representation, uh, an example of a dialysis machine that uh, many of you uh, have seen. And here I talk about breathing machines. The iron lung, first developed in the late 1920s, uh, here is a field of iron lungs of the sort that used to exist when, when polio was rampant in this country. Uh, it was replaced in, in the 60s by the so-called bird pressure vent, and which was still in use when I developed an intensive care unit in 1971. And only in 1975 did they introduce the new Bennett volume ventilators, which had a, the important thing about Bennett's is that they were there in large numbers and they worked. They could actually keep people alive people with respiratory problems alive indefinitely. And so if you think of 1975 or 76 as the introduction of the first effective breathing machine, many of the ethical issues that have emerged with regard to end-of-life care required the ability to forestall death. And some of it is as recent, as I say, as 1975 or 76. That's just 30 years. That, that's less than a, than a generation. Um, and, and I make that point in this slide, that, that the availability of technology to prolong the end of life has raised a set of ethical issues that mankind never had to deal with before. But now you have to start to talk about them since you've got the technology. When do you withhold the use of breathing machines? When do you withdraw, by which I mean stop them after they've been started? When, how do people make their own advanced directives? What do we mean by situation being futile? And how do you deal with surrogates when individuals are not able to talk to you themselves? I, I want you to keep that in mind because I'm gonna come back to some of these topics um, as we move towards the future. The second area I wanna refer to is human experimentation and some of the problems that have emerged uh, in, in human research. Um, you all know about the Nuremberg trials, which, which were a series of trials that followed uh, World War II. Two of those trials um, uh, tried uh, the Nazi doctors uh, who committed uh, 
horrific abuses of subjects, um, torturing and at times killing human subjects uh, in, the, in the name of medical research. Um, for all those who thought that nothing like Nuremberg could ever happen in a civilized country that was not at war, uh, Tuskegee set their minds to rest because the Tuskegee experiments, which were um, revealed by the junior senator from Massachusetts uh, in 1971, that is Mr. Kennedy, uh, Ted Kennedy, um, recounted a 40-year legacy that had started in the 1930s in Macon County, Georgia, in which black men were enrolled in a study uh, that was tracking the effects of syphilis, the natural history uh, of syphilis uh, on these men. Um, and, um, and then even when penicillin became available after World War II, it was kept secret from the men who were not treated, even though people knew that penicillin was an effective treatment for syphilis, uh, until Kennedy and a newspaper man, Mr. Buxton, broke the story in, in 1971-72. Out of the Tuskegee uh, uh, revelation came a set of regulations for the protection of human subjects, which are now part of the Federal Code of Regulations, passed initially in 1981, and, un, and which have undergone two revisions in 91 and 2001, and which to my mind are holding extremely well. They, they really have reduced the level of abuse of human subjects dramatically. They've given us institutional review boards and subject informed consent and, and voluntary uh, involvement of subjects. The third area I wanna say that, that has really affected medicine and bioethics in the last 50 years has been an emergence of a new understanding of civil and human rights. It's essentially a redefinition in the United States and elsewhere of the relationship between individuals and authorities. Um, uh, and it started clearly in this country with the civil rights movement. Uh, I show you Rosa Parks being fingerprinted uh, in Montgomery. Um, and it, what followed in the late 1960s was a student rights movement, soon thereafter the woman, women's rights movement, and tucked into all of this, there was also a patient rights movement. A patient rights movement which has given us uh, an overturning of the traditional medical paternalism, which, uh, which said that the doctor knew best, to a new system of decision making in which patients are active participants in their own um, healthcare decisions. Um, and, and this has led to increased disclosure and transparency about medical issues, informed consent from patients, and promises of privacy and renewed uh, assurances of confidentiality. Um, those were the issues that took us the last 50 years. And one of the things I'm about to say is that as I look ahead, I think there's gonna be activity in each of those three areas for the next 30 or 40 years. And, and just to show you that we haven't resolved all of the issues, let's say, about end-of-life care, I call your attention to the case that dominated the news about a year, a year and a half ago, the case of Terry Schiavo. Um, many of you remember Ms. Schiavo, um, the woman from Florida. Um, th this is a picture of Ms. Schiavo um, in, in her nursing home. Uh, it has pictures of some of the other participants in the case. The, the facts of the case um, got somewhat muddled as things were going along, but here's a picture of Ms. Schiavo as she was in 1990. Um, she had a, a collapse in her home um, that left her in a state of unconsciousness um, from which she never awoke. She was 27 at the time that the event happened. Uh, some years later, using Florida law, Ms. Shivo's husband was appointed her guardian. She couldn't make decisions for herself, and so the husband was asked to make decisions. Years later, five years later, Ms. Shivo's parents and her brother objected to a petition from the husband 
to stop Ms. Schiavo's feeding tube, which would essentially result in her death. Um, and um, the court heard the objection in 2000, but ruled that based on testimony that it heard, uh, Ms. Schiavo would have wanted the feeding tube to be removed and would have wanted to be allowed to die. In October 2003, after many legal battles, the court allowed Schiavo's husband to have the tube removed. At that point, all things, everything broke loose. Terry's law was passed in an emergency session of the Florida legislature that allowed the Florida governor to issue, quote, a one-time stay in certain cases, meaning in that case. Uh, that permitted them to reinsert the feeding tube that had been removed. The Florida Supreme Court ruled that the Florida law, Terry's law, was unconstitutional. The feeding tube was taken out again. Um, in March of 2005, the US Supreme Court let the Florida ruling stand that Terry's law was unconstitutional, and the feeding tube was removed, I think this is about the third or fourth time, and then Mr. Bush signed another law that was passed as an emergency, so-called law for the relief of Teresa Marie Schiavo. And on May 31st, 2005, Ms. Schiavo died after all the courts, every court up to the Supreme Court, refused to rule that her feeding tube should be reinserted for about the fourth time, while the president's law, that is for the release of Teresa Marie Schiavo, that law was being appealed. It was quite an extraordinary set of legal and legislative initiatives. It gave rise to three ethical considerations. What was Schiavo's current condition and prognosis? What interventions were needed to keep her alive? And what did this have to say about the issue of advanced directives? It turned out that there was universal agreement that her condition was one of profound and permanent neurological devastation. Everybody agreed about that. The only question was what was her final diagnosis? Was she in something they called the persistent vegetative state or a newer diagnosis called minimally conscious? It turns out that it probably didn't make much difference which of these particular conditions she had. Her prognosis was as grim as everybody thought it was. She had been unconscious for the better part of 10 years, 15 years, and was not going to regain consciousness. With regard to the interventions needed to keep her alive, and this was the subject of much discussion, she had a working feeding tube, which was really not causing her very much discomfort, and so far as people knew, no pain. And so the decision by her husband to remove that tube was not done as a matter of comfort for Ms. Schiavo. And I don't think he claimed it to be that. Rather, it was, it was removed on the basis of dignity and what she would have wanted. And, and in the light of the benefits and harms that would fall to her, removed she would die. With the tube in, she would continue to survive in her, in her debilitated state. But his decision for her as her surrogate was not based on pain, but on dignity. And that led to the question about advanced directives. She did not have them. Most 27-year-olds do not have advanced directives. Um, I remember once, uh, this goes back many, many years, uh, sitting around the table um, with my son. Um, talking about the Karen Quinlan case, which was an earlier case from New Jersey about end-of-life decisions. And my son, who is then seven or eight, said that he would not want to be kept alive if his brain function dropped below 25%. Now, I'd, I'd been in the field for about 20 years. I had never heard anybody quite put it like that. I, you know, I mean, if below 25, nobody has ever put a percentage next to it. 
So I said, too bad you can't write, or you could write that out, we'd have an advanced directive. <laughs> but I'm going to come back to that son, who's a lovely young man. Um, but um, so there was no indication of what she would have wanted, no written documentation. There was clearly disagreement. You saw it played out in, in all of these press conferences and uh, between the husband and the parents and the brother about what she would have wanted under these circumstances. Um, it, it was a set of circumstances like that that raised public awareness about the importance of advanced directives. In an ABC News poll, 49% of those polled said they had had conversations about end-of-life care with family members because of what had been going on for months regarding the Shivo case. Um, and it raised issues about who should be the surrogate in making decisions for people. But if you have advanced directives, it overcomes the importance of the surrogate decision because you tell in advance what you want. Up until the Shivo case, fewer than 10% of Americans had any kind of advanced directive, e either written or oral. And the belief is that since the Shivo case, that number probably has gone up, maybe even doubled. I mean, it still leaves 80% without, but it, it's a substantial increase. So this is Siegler's effort uh, in, in his very limited artistic career to talk about end-of-life decisions. Is the glass half full or half empty? You see, this is a glass, OK? That's water. And you see water. <laughs> and this is empty up here and full down here. Now, the glass is half empty because we have terrible continuing problems with a lot of the stuff that we saw in Shivo, with surrogacy, that is, who should, who should speak for people who can speak for themselves? And we have trouble with advanced directives in that people don't fill them out and don't tell their family and don't tell their doctor clearly what they want. And of course, we have persisting problems that have gotten very not much better since my years as a medical resident back in the late 60s, and that's the issue of pain control, um, uh, which I said today on the radio station in, in an interview was, in my view, the worst clinical ethical problem that we're still facing, pain management. And I'm, I'm not talking about just terminal care. I'm talking about pain management for post-operative people, for chronic pain syndromes, and the like. Uh, that's the glass half empty. But here's the glass half full. And my sympathies are actually in terms of the glass half full. In one generation, that is since 1970 or 75, when we had effective breathing machines, our generation, all of you in the audience and me, have come to a political, social, religious, and clinical agreement that most end-of-life decisions can be reached without controversy and without political and legal battles. We have more than 1.7 million people dying in this country in institutions every year. And of that 1.7 million, I'm prepared to say most of them don't die of sudden death. Most of them die of anticipated deaths. And most of the deaths are negotiated. By negotiated, I mean that not everything that can be done to maximize and prolong life indefinitely is done, and that the decisions are reached in a mutual and respectful way among doctors and families and nurses and hospitals about what to do in the interest of patients. It is a staggeringly remarkable achievement in one generation. That 98, 99% of the deaths that occur in this country in institutional settings without going to court and without fights, quite in contrast to the Shivo case, is the, is the glass half full. And it's the one that I think is, is an achievement that has not been heralded and not been much flagged in this country. All you hear about are the Shivo-type cases when they go to court, when they get onto television. 
you don't hear about this simple uh, this, um, evolution. The second one I want to talk about is human experimentation, abuse of human subjects in research. Um, and I think I'm going to be fairly brief on this. Uh, there are a lot of things I could have dealt with. I, I picked for today's talk innovative surgery. Um, some of you heard about face transplants. There's, there's not been one done in the United States yet. Um, um, the French, as you know, did the first face transplant uh, about a um, little under a year ago in the, in the woman who, whose face was um, marred and scarred by dog bites. Um, th th this is the woman who was bitten by her dog. And this is actually after the transplant um, uh, and the surgery that was performed in November of 05 was thought of as a success. Um, the Cleveland Clinic has, uh, has, I was there just a week or two ago, uh, has given approval about three months ago uh, to do a, um, a face transplant. They're searching for a suitable candidate. They've not done the first case yet in the United States. Um, I, I talk about face transplants because they're examples of innovative surgery. And the ethical question is the one that I'm interested in is how do you encourage advances in surgery while protecting the welfare, that is the clinical benefit and the safety of participants, in that the surgeons are not big on clinical trials, the way we, there are trials uh, for medicines. Surgical innovation is not subject to formal regulatory process like new drugs or devices are. There is no FDA for surgeons. And surgical innovation, therefore, relies on the oversight and integrity of the team, the surgical team, and the institution, which often will do things without formal approval from the Institutional Review Board. Um, and in fact, many earlier surgical advances, I show you here appendix operations, gallbladder operations, the introduction of anesthesia, the development of clean aseptic surgery, taking out mastoids, taking out tonsils, all of these surgical advances were not done using clinical trials. And more recent surgical advances, many of them still in practice today, like open heart surgery or coronary bypass surgery, organ transplant, video assisted thyroid operations, endoscopic surgery of all sorts, abdominal and sinus, and even cochlear implants for deafness, none of these have been subjected to the kind of scrutiny that a new drug would get under, F or, or for that matter, a new device. If you need a new device to do these operations, then the FDA will take a look at it, and, and so will your IRB. But if you can do these, these operations just by virtue of your intelligence and manual skill, then nobody controls it. Um, and some of the other surgical innovations that are out there, laryngeal transplants, brain implants, for par adrenal implants for Parkinson's, living liver donor operations and the like. Um, I don't want to say much more about that today, but it is an area in which the protection of human subjects is balanced against medical progress. And it's one in which, for the moment, we don't have any formal regulation, and therefore it's worthy of our attention. The third area I want to talk about Remember, I, I mentioned civil and human rights. I want to talk about it in terms of health care reform. <clears throat> I show you here an article from the September 26th New York Times. So really within the last week, panel urges basic coverage on health care. This is a federal advisory panel said Monday that Congress should take immediate steps to guarantee that all Americans have access to affordable health care by 2012, a 14-member panel appointed by the Comptroller General of the United States. Um, I think the current state of health care is worth our noting. The failure of managed care, or its collapse, left us with many of the same problems that managed care was intended to solve. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. And meanwhile, issues relating to access have gotten worse highlighting the need uh, for some other kind of reform. In the 1980s, the prof medical profession shifted to a consumer-oriented model of healthcare. The idea was that physician gatekeepers, 
would manage cost and help patients navigate the system. And then the cost savings that were achieved would be used to improve access for the uninsured. That was the theory behind managed care. And so the ostensible goals of managed care, this is the system that emerged in the late 80s and prevailed through most of the 90s, was control costs, improve access, and in the process, improve quality. Those were the ostensible goals. Unfortunately, the actual goals of managed care focused primarily on containing cost. And issues about access and quality were, were relegated to lower levels of concern. And, um, and the focus on cost uh, alienated the American middle class. And by the time the gurus of managed care realized that they had they had misread the American public, it was too late to change. And as a result, they gave up on the managed care strategies and left the system slightly worse than the way they found it. Uh, it's left us with higher overall costs, higher out-of-pocket costs to patients, and dramatically worsening problems with access and availability. Um, this is a slide through 2004 that simply shows national health care expenditures by 2004 approaching $1.8 trillion a year. These days, pretty close to $2 trillion uh, a year. Um, in terms of per capita costs, also is staggeringly high. Uh, it's, it's approaching 7000 per person today. Uh, the following slide you can't see from the back very well. This is the U.S. This is 2003 percent of GDP. The U.S. is up close to 16 percent even in 2003. Nobody else except uh, who is this? Switzerland. Switzerland is up uh, about 11 percent, and then a fewer 10 percent. And most of the countries of the world, including those with much better health statistics than ours are well below 10%. So we spend more than anybody else. We spend more per capita than anybody else. And we spend more of the GDP. And we have a bigger GDP to start with. In fact, if you looked at the world's leading economies by like that $2 trillion in the American health system, that would compare to the sixth leading economy in the world uh, after Japan and Germany and France, England, and maybe Italy and the American health system compete each year as to which is six and which is seven. But that's how big these numbers are. So how, how do we do it? I mean, how, how can our numbers continue to rise in terms of expenditures, yet the number of uninsured continue to increase also? Why does the US spend more on healthcare than any other developed nation while having the worst statistics with regard to access and just sort of average statistics with regard to quality. Infant mortality, maternal mortality, life expectancy. We're just in the top 20 or 25. We're not near the, the top 10. How do we do it? It's, it's really quite extraordinary. I'm not sure I've got a clear answer. With regard to access, there are recently, this is 2005, 46 million uninsured Americans. Let me tell you who these uninsured people are. It's quite interesting to think about them. In terms of age, 55% are between 18 and 34, which is to say kind of the young, healthy population. But 12% are children under 18. And some of them, a third of them, are sort of between 35 and 64, middle age and, and beyond, but not quite qualifying for Medicare. Work status, it's quite amazing. 59% are full-time workers. You hear that? 59 are full-time workers, not part-time. And then uh, another 16% are part-time, and only 25% of the uninsured are unemployed. 50%, or 48% are white, 29% are Hispanic, and 17% are African-American blacks. Um, and socioeconomic status, 
33% earn less than 25,000, a third earn between 25 and 50, and then you've got 17% who earn 75,000 or more. So you've got heavily white, heavily employed, and young as making up a substantial amount. But you also have kids, and you have some older people, and some who are very poor, uh, this under 25,000, well below the US poverty level. The access and availability is probably even worse than we originally thought. A report last year by Families USA said that nearly 82 million Americans under the age of 65 were without health insurance for all a part of 2002-2003, and of that 82 million, two-thirds were uninsured for six months or more. So it's actually a number that's almost double that, that 46 million. If you look at people who sometime during the calendar year were lacking in insurance, these are often people and their families who are without insurance. These are really just terribly frightening statistics. The employer-sponsored health insurance is shrinking in the United States at unprecedented rates. It took off in World War II with the Kaiser Industries in San Francisco, but between 1980 and 2000, the proportion of mid-sized companies offering health coverage for retirees fell from 86% to 37%. That's a New England Journal report this year. And even the insured have in huge increases in out-of-pocket costs. And, um, uh, the New York Times article that I referred to a few minutes ago said Congress should take immediate steps to guarantee that all Americans have access to health insurance by 2002. And so the future of health care reforms will include improving access, reducing out-of-pocket costs, and a new focus, a more dedicated focus than ever before, on preventive care and continuity of care. Um, but, but more cost effective, this will be more cost effective than our current sickness-based system. Some of the experiments, the most interesting ones, are going on in states. Illinois has developed something called All Kids, which offers a Medicaid-type benefit to all uninsured kids to encourage well care. Uh, Illinois has said that there will not be any co-payments for preventive services and immunizations for children. I mean, that's quite a remarkable statement. A similar program, Healthy Kids in California, uh, offers the potential to cover all uninsured children, regardless of immigration status, which is very important in California with, with, with a large number of immigrants in their population. Massachusetts has initiated um, hundreds of thousands of uninsured people will now obtain affordable, high-quality coverage over three years. Um, and by July of 2007, all Massachusetts residents must carry a minimum level of health insurance, either purchased themselves or purchased by the state. And Maine has developed a Massachusetts-like plan called the Dorigo Health Reform Act, which promises reforms in terms of cost, quality, and access, aimed to make universal access possible in Maine within five years. Um, Keep an eye, I say, on the progress of state-level reforms. Um, some of these more successful programs, Illinois and California for Kids, Massachusetts and Maine, uh, may be used as models for reforms at the national level, uh, especially after the next national election. Healthcare is quickly emerging, and it has not been there before, as increasingly important to the public. Uh, even two years ago, Healthcare was ranked seventh or eighth in terms of the public's ranking of what was important, and it now has jumped to third behind only the war in Iraq and terrorism. So the war is number one, terrorism is two, and for the first time in 15 years, healthcare has jumped up as high as number three. Um, unless I get help, I'm in bad trouble here. Um, and I, I am really close to the end of my talk. Um, I, I'm going to end with, um, uh, with, with one. What I wanted to say, I, I did hear a couple of beeps that sounded ominous. Those, those suggested that
But I, I can tell you when I, are we back up? Yep, somebody's got to put in a password though. Oh, do you have a pen? <laughs> Roar. It's written, oh, here it is. Ah, okay. Yeah. 190. Oh, uh, gotcha. Thank you. Oh, good. No, it's working. I, I've told you that three of the challenges, the, these advances in technology and, and life and death, oh gosh, come back, come back, and, and human experimentation and civil rights and health reform are part of the old issues that are going forward. I now want to say the new issue for, for this century is going to be global health. Um, and um, everybody is getting involved and committed to, um, to ethical problems in global health. There's an increasing recognition of the devastating effects of the disease burden in the developing world. And bioethics has become one of the platforms for implementing global health initiatives. Um, here are some of the disparities at the global level. If average life expectancy in the developed nations is now very close to 80 years, in Japan, which leaves the, uh, uh, the world, is about 83 or 84 years, um, but, but on average about 80 years in the developed nations. Life expectancy in the developing world is uh, 50 years, and, um, and in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, including Russia, life expectancy is actually on the decline. 90% of all deaths of children under five years old occur in just 42 countries, 39 of them in sub-Saharan Africa. And a large number of the deaths in the developing world uh, are preventable. The vaccinations for the major childhood illnesses could save one to two million kids a year. Uh, and if all the world's children were covered by simple and not very expensive interventions, that are known to be effective, the risk of death in childhood would fall to about a third of its current level, and these interventions could save five to six million children annually in the world. Um, the three great global killers are tuberculosis, uh, which has almost 15 million current cases, malaria that affects more than 400 million, and HIV AIDS that affects almost 40 million people worldwide. Um, there are drugs for these illnesses. There are no vaccines at the moment, um, and, um, and things can be done. Uh, these are the big three. Um, I, I show you roughly deaths per year. Tuberculosis, about two million around the world. Malaria, a million is, a, I think, a gross understatement. And HIV, three million. Uh, and the percent of the cases of these diseases in the developing countries are shown here. 84% for TB, 99% for malaria, 92% for HIV and AIDS. Um, th this is a picture of the Peace Corps in Benin. Uh, the picture does not have my son in it, but he sent it to me. My son has been a volunteer in Benin, uh, West Africa, for the last two and a half years. He's going to stay there for another year or two. Uh, he's working on HIV prevention. He's building uh, hospitals uh, to care for, for uh, women's health and children's health. Um, and um, he's very dedicated to his work. That's the same son who told me about the 25% brain function. Uh, he still, still has his brain function. And he sent me this picture uh, of his colleagues uh, from Benin. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is quite extraordinary. Um, uh, as, as, as the Gates has said, supporting children's immunizations in the developing world is undoubtedly the best investment we've ever made. Um, the Gates Foundation mission is to encourage the development of life-saving medical advances and to ensure that they reach people who are disproportionately affected. And to that end, the Gates Foundation committed uh, $250 million to combat malaria in the developing world. Uh, it contributed $500 million over the next five years 
to focus on AIDS, TB, and malaria in the developing world, and another 104 million uh, to develop a cure, faster cure for tuberculosis. It works with um, partners um, such as governments in both the developed and developing countries, UNICEF, WHO, the World Bank, and, and many others. Uh, it works with Big Pharma, which has uh, stepped up to the plate, and um, GlaxoSmithKline uh, Glaxo um, has developed one of the more aggressive campaigns to assist in the developing world, supplying 540 million vaccine doses at great discounts to UNICEF, WHO, and Gavi, and has provided 116 different drugs with subsidy arrangements in 50 countries. Merck developed an orphan drug uh, as a product for river blindness. There was no money in it at all, and they developed it. They uh, distributed it to the countries, and it's possible that river blindness will be eliminated as a disease in the next three to five years. Uh, Pfizer has offered 2 million Diflucan tablets in the development, developing world and has donated $315 million uh, just, just in terms of Diflucan. You may have heard that a couple of weeks ago, Warren Buffett said, Gates 30 billion is fantastic. I'm going to throw into the Gates plan 31 billion for my fortune. And he said, this is beautiful. I came to realize that there was a terrific foundation that was already scaled up. What can be more logical in whatever you want done than finding someone better equipped than you are to do it, said Buffett. He gave five-sixths of his fortune, reserving, remember, about $6 billion. He gave each of his three kids a billion for their foundations, and I don't know what he did with the other three or four billion, but he gave it to Gates because he liked their program and he liked their commitment. Um, and um, I'm very proud of the fact that one of my former fellows, Peter Singer, in Toronto, is running the ethics portion of the Gates Foundation effort in the developing world. Um, and, and the Gates Foundation gave the Toronto people $15 million to monitor the ethics by which the, the foundation is taking advances into 50 or 60 developing countries. And it's a tremendous initiative, nothing like it anywhere in the world. And so in conclusion, uh, those three things that I talked about stay the same but some things do change. Um, I think that bioethics will continue to struggle with issues about life and death, issues involving uh, human research, uh, and issues of expanding human rights, especially to develop universal access to health care. This country is the only country in the world that does not have such a program. But I do also think that global health has come along largely thanks to, to the Gates Foundation, but not entirely, uh, to be the greatest bioethical challenge uh, that we're all going to face in the 21st century. I want to thank you again so much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful Millicom lecture series. Uh, I want to thank my hosts. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And thank you to the audience for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think the sacrifice of the animal, although not all of it. That course bit the dust about five or ten years ago. Um, uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult, in fact, uh, to, to train young surgeons, uh, medical students who are interested in surgery, or young surgeons themselves um, without access to, to animals. Um, so that, that, that's a real uh, change in, in medical education. What, what's replaced it, of course, is simulators of various kinds, which any of the old guard surgeons will say, oh, it's, not, it's just not the same <laughs> working on simulators. As, as I'm, and I don't do enough surgery. I haven't done any since, since medical school to, to comment. Um, but but the, 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 the change in physiology, pathophysiology, and, and um, surgical training has, has been substantial. Uh, and, and I think that it's simply conforming with the new insight into, um, into animal welfare that's emerged. 
And, um, uh, and I, think that, I think that the attitude towards animals is not just one taken by animal welfare proponents, but it's also taken increasingly by medical students and trainees in medicine. So it's, it's on both sides that as a, a young generation has grown up with quite different attitudes towards animal work than, than the old generation. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a huge change. Do you think the medical community is prepared to defend their use of it? I mean, maybe not so much in teaching and training, but in actually developing techniques where it's really pretty critical. Yeah, I, I think the medical community has not been as uh, clear and articulate as it could be. In, in defending a reduced but critically important area in which continued animal work is essential. Um, they tend to be reactive. Uh, th that is, there tends to be a protest march outside the laboratories and several people will get up and uh, offer a defense. There, there's not been a real proactive stance um, on the part of the medical community. It's not one of the big issues. Um, a friend of mine, a philosopher, wrote a lovely essay about 10 years ago, published in the Hastings Center, about animal rights and animal welfare, called The Troubled Middle. His name is Donnelly, Strawn Donnelly. And, um, and I thought Donnelly had it right, that he saw both sides. He, he called the essay The Troubled Middle, and that he saw the two sides, and he, he wasn't a special proponent of animal research, but he saw the essential areas in which it was important. Um, but nobody's paid any attention to that essay either. So. As a follow-up to that, there's a recent article in The Scientist, which just comes out regularly, and the students at Oxford University in England take it upon themselves to form a anti-anti group, and it's been very successful in getting things done there because a fellow by the name of Colin Blakemore, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, is the head of the uh, group there, neurological group, and he found that not only him, but his family was being, uh, if you want to call it, harassed and threatened physically, and he was had to check his car every day to see whether it's bombed and stuff yeah. like that. Well, these students now have taken it upon themselves, and I think it's maybe time for us to encourage our students to take a hand in this instead of us being defensive all the time, take a proactive part in this. Yes, very nicely said. Um, the, the animal rights movement in the United States has, generally speaking, not been nearly as threatening and violent as the animal rights movement in Europe and especially in England, where, uh, where I think there have been deaths uh, attributed to, uh, to animal rights proponents. Um, there have been some cases in this country, the destruction of a neurosurgical lab at the University of Pennsylvania about 10 years ago, uh, which, which was a primate lab that, that was doing some very important uh, head trauma research and was following uh, the primates for long periods of time, um, uh, which was um, destroyed. Uh, similar things at Wisconsin and Virginia. But, but, but as far as I know, very little physical violence against the scientists of the sort that, that is threatened, as you say, in England. I, I like the idea of the anti-anti. Uh, maybe we could even call it the pro. <laughs> well, they call themselves pro-pets. Pro? pro <laughs> good, good. Sure. I'm curious about the medical ethical debate surrounding uh, medical involvement in detainees at Guantanamo. Yes. It's my understanding that the British medical community has been quite outspoken on this, and I'm wondering what the American community has, has had to say. Yeah. Um, the, the American community has equally been quite outspoken. Um, uh, one of my uh, former students and colleagues, uh, Dr. Steve Miles from Minnesota, uh, has actually published a book about a month ago uh, about um, uh, about the um, um, the unethical behavior of physicians uh, in their complicity in torture of prisoners. So, so there is a book out. Uh, uh, the author is Stephen Miles. Um, 
and it, it's, he, he was down in Chicago uh, speaking about the book uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, I mean, physician involvement in a whole set of societally, societally driven issues such as capital punishment and torture um, and um, has, has, always, has always been extremely difficult and problematic for the medical profession. How to, how to work within a society and, and somehow maintain distance. That's especially the case when you get into these problems of dual loyalty. That is, you, you have, I don't know what, physicians who work for the state or physicians who work for the military and, and they have allegiances to, to more than one master. And, and how strong can be the, how strong can the medical ethic be in defending them against actions that most physicians would regard as unacceptable and unethical. Um, but with regard to specifically to, to Guantanamo, take a look at this new book. Please. Combination question between your economics that you had put out, the cost and ethics. Uh, what what are the the issues for the medical community not promoting what we would call a basic health system in the United States in comparison to Europe, where we have basic health services from birth all the way through, uh, and uh, the issue of our system is basically well known for its acute services, but not its preventive services. Yeah. Would you comment on those? Well, it's a hard, hard issue to comment on. Um, I, I would still, I would still, without, without exonerating the medical community, say that, that um, the primary difficulty is the unwillingness of this country, separate and alone among the countries of the world, to acknowledge a universal right to health care. That, that, that until, until something like that is affirmed and paid for, it becomes very difficult for individual doctors or even hospitals or collection of hospitals to develop the kind of health package that you think is essential, and I would agree with you, uh, a basic health package that, that tracks people from birth uh, through aging and illness and unto un death. Um, I, I, I still think that's a social and political decision primarily rather than, than, than laying the blame heavily on, 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 the, on the profession of medicine. Uh, I think the profession of medicine um, uh, can, can respond very nicely uh, to a social and political payment program that, that provided such incentives and, and supported it. Please. Your talk has stimulated several dozen questions, <laughs> but I'll spare you those. And I, I would make a comment. I heard a discussion on NPR about the role of labor unions related to, I think it was General Motors, yeah. and that one of the failures of those negotiations was to provide health care which followed the person rather than stuck with the company. That there was a time in the history, apparently, where that was a possibility, and the owners of those companies or their investors apparently side sideswiped that issue. So that, I, I hadn't thought about that. that that's fascinating. Um, I'd like to make a comment and I have a question. One of the issues, ethics comes up in almost every aspect of our lives. And uh, what I don't hear a discussion of often is the ethics of financial gain in this country. You mentioned the Bill Gates Foundation, which is rather re recent. And one of the issues it brings up is the failure of governmental agencies to deal with these issues effectively. The American government uh, has consistently denied funds that it agreed to give to the World Health Organization for uh, things related to um, sexuality or things which have health issues related to people's sexuality. 
under the guise that this was immoral of some sorts. And so the World Health Organization, which is one that comes to mind that could have done some of these things, has failed essentially to do this over my lifetime, essentially. Yeah. And so that uh, I don't hear a discussion of the financial packages for CEOs of large HMOs. I don't hear discussion of the financial ethics of forcing physicians to have gag orders. And one which is rather recent, I had a discussion with some uh, uh, workers in transcription at, at a hospital and uh, they were told by their CEO that if they, dis if they said anything negative about the new computer system, which was abysmal, they would be fired. Um, and so the corporate issues, the ethics of the corporations, which have been in the news, uh, yet at the same time, uh, the ethics seem to be used as control mechanisms. You mentioned in terms of surgery and the FDA. I'm not aware of any device or medication that the FDA prevented from coming to market where they were the ones that indicated there was a fault with it. Uh, there, were, there were maybe a dozen or so which after the fact they would pull from the market. So I don't see that as an, that government, again, is the government effective. So I've kind of uh, covered a, a few things related more to these, the ethics in these other areas. Uh, we're sort of looking over here all the time and these are the ones that I in some ways see affecting us. It's a hard, hard comment to, to respond to, but there's so much there. Um, uh, but but I, I also heard that, that, that we had withheld some of our uh, earlier commitments to um, developing countries uh, around issues of reproduction and sexuality, um, uh, areas of extraordinary importance in places like sub-Saharan Africa, um, where um, uh, where the role of women in society is is much undervalued, and um, and and where um, uh, where a woman's uh, life and career path can be short circuited at the age of 12 or 13, um, and we had made commitments uh, uh, to, to WHO, and for political reasons, I think, uh, failed to um, to meet those commitments. So. Um, uh, I don't know, one, one hopes that a change in uh, administration may lead to a more uh, far-sighted um, uh, commitment uh, to global health, a, a sense that global health is important to us, not only for being a do-good activity, but, but because we are these days uh, mutually interdependent throughout the world. Um, and. Um, one, one just hopes that things will change and change for the better. Please. I was interested in your comments about healthcare reform and the data that you had about insurance. A um, couple of thoughts and comments, and one is it seems like in this country there's an increase in the number of people who are self-employed, meaning they're going to have to find insurance somewhere. Um, your data also suggested that businesses are offering insurance less often, medical insurance coverage. And um, the cost of insurance is also increasing when you have to go and, for anyone, but especially when you have to go and purchase it as an individual subscriber. Um, and then also related to that whole thing is the issue of um, uh, pre-existing conditions and lack of eligibility for many, many reasons. Um, yes. My family of three is all medically unel ineligible uh, for any sort of private insurance. And a couple years ago, we were looking at what was going to cost us um, 60000 a year for, um, for the uninsured insurance um, through the state, if we could get on that. 60000 yes, a year? Yes, and for um, medications, yes. Um, fortunately, something happened, but that's what we were looking at in terms of the numbers. And so it's what we're costing someone too, I assume. Um, the other thing, I'm self-employed, and so that was a part of the issue. The other thing though that I see happening when people are um, paying out of their own pocket or buying their own insurance is that they're buying insurance plans with a very high deductible. And so then when they're being billed, when you go to your clinic or hospital, they are being billed at the full price, whereas most of the people who are coming through with insurance, managed care, or whatever, are being billed out at a negotiated rate or um, a federally mandated um, Medicare rate. 
And so what I see happening, and I worry about it, is that um, you know, people with initiative to go out to work on their own, that sort of thing, are getting into positions where they can't leave their job, where their family, I, um, I work with individuals who have disabilities, families can't leave the job because they've got insurance that would never be covered again, um, and that these are the people also who are ending up paying the full price. So those are just kind of some comments, and I don't know if you have anything um, in terms of response, but it certainly is um, well, a real-life instance. No, no, no. I, I, I take your comments to be um, a, a powerful endorsement of the need for health reform, which I am absolutely in agreement with. Um, $60,000 for a family of three uh, out of pocket very few people in the country can afford that sort of money, um, uh, huge deductibles. I mean, it's, it's the argument for some sort of acknowledgement that, that we have a need in this country for a universal health care system and universal entitlement. And we are the last country in the world not to have such a thing. South Africa changed about seven or eight years ago. I, I could always say there were two countries, us and South Africa. Can't even say that anymore. Um, after apartheid, South Africa changed and developed such a system. But everything you said simply speaks to the need to support Illinois' Kids First program, to, uh, to watch the experiments in Massachusetts and Maine, to think carefully about the next uh, uh, congressional election, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, to think towards the presidential election, to hear, to, I mean, as health care rises to number three in, in citizens' priorities, one anticipates that there may be a coming together of sufficient voices of concern to actually lead to having something done. Uh, not, nothing much has happened really since the Clinton reform effort of 93-94. Yeah, in discussions about universal health care, it seems like uh, there are two competing claims which may or may not be ethical. On the one hand, the high cost of modern technological medicine cannot be sustained at a universal level. It's, it's just too expensive. And this suggests then that certain procedures perhaps simply can't be performed. On the other hand, there's an almost absolute requirement that we provide all those treatments and therapies available to us to sustain life, especially when we're talking about people like me and you, the older folks, hey, yeah. where the largest share of our health care dollars are being spent. How do we reconcile these two competing claims? I think that's the American way. You don't <laughs> reconcile it, and that's what gives rise to us paying more than any other country in the world, absolutely in per capita. Because as, as your first point said, in America, only the best is good enough, right? I mean, there's, there's no middle ground. And in addition, based on fairness and justice and equality, everybody deserves or is entitled to the best. And therefore, if you could overcome the access problems, it, I think, would clearly lead to an, a substantial uh, increase in the cost of health care. Now, the, the one point at which I might disagree with you is, is this long-standing debate on how much can a country like ours afford to spend for health care. I showed you we're spending 16 or 17 percent of the GDP now, which is quite more than other countries. Now, I didn't show you that we're spending something like 52 percent on, on defense, right, um, which, which has always been the, the big part of the pot. Um, there is a feeling that, that there is no sector in the American economy that is more progressive and functioning in good and interesting ways than the health sector, and that maybe it could tolerate a, a modest increase to 20 or 22 or 24 percent because it's, it's the engine of innovation and development and progress that sort of you know, goes along with, with the American free enterprise notion. 
and, and maybe it could tolerate even more than it is, and even if it's more than all these other countries. Because when, when you start to figure out where all that money is going to, turns out, sadly, that not enough is coming to doctors, OK? I mean, it's, it's, it's going to hospitals and to drug companies and to, and to research plans and, and, and to a lot of wonderful things that are going on under the overall umbrella of healthcare. So it was a great, I think we're going to end with that question. Can we end with that question? Because I think you, you put in a capsule what the American dilemma is. We want to do only the best for everybody, and everybody deserves it, and how can we afford it? And I think the secret is that America is the richest country in the world by far, and by gosh, we can afford it, you know? I mean, you have ups and downs, but, but this is something that has to be done, and I think can be done within the budget. Uh, not, not to say that we're perfect as we are. I mean, there's a lot of places I think can, we can legitimately cut costs and, and not be wasteful in our expenditures. But, um, but we can spend a little bit more in an effective way. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.